Hebrews chapter 10 is kind of a continuation of what we've been studying about Jesus as our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. That means he's a high priest like no other high priest. And there's a radical difference between his priesthood and his offering and all the other Levitical priests and their daily offerings. And we're going to continue that to illustrate a very, very important point for all of us today, one that I've seen for the last almost 50 years of ministry destroy people, destroy their families, destroy their relationships, destroy their lives personally. And I'm not just talking about the heathen out there. I'm talking about Christian people. I'm talking about people who have trusted Jesus as their personal Savior. And then get sidetracked. They get sidetracked and fall back into their old lifestyle. So it was natural to them. It actually violates what God has in mind for us. So it's kind of like, on the one hand, God's got all this good stuff for us. Wonderful stuff. Stuff you can't even imagine. On the other hand, we've got our idea of what good stuff we want. And it's not anything compared to what God wants. And so we're going to kind of continue that theme here this morning as we enter into Hebrews chapter 10. Let me just read the verses to you. We're going to go all the way through verse 18 on this. So let me just read them to you so you can catch up. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along. If not, you can just listen to the reading of the Word. For the law, chapter 10, verse 1, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Now all that is King James English for this. That what was prescribed under the Mosaic Law with all the sacrifices that the priests made didn't get rid of of sins or of sin consciousness. You're still guilty. Even though those sins were covered up, that's what atonement means, covered up, hidden if you will, you know yourself you were guilty of doing those. And their conscience, this sin consciousness continued to plague them. And I've seen that sin consciousness, by the way, plague a bunch of people. In fact, most of the counseling I've done over the last 40 years with people who are plagued by a sin consciousness, thinking of themselves as the same old person they were born into this world as. And when you think of yourself that way, with that sin consciousness, then you feel that way. And when you feel that way, you act that way. So to put it in just everyday language, when you believe you're worthless and you're trying to make yourself worthy, you feel worthless. And when you feel worthless, you act worthless. And then some somebody's going to come along and say, Man, you're worthless. The cycle continues. You follow what I'm saying? That's the sin consciousness we're talking about here. And my point of our author here is that all those sacrifices in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, all those sacrifices made daily by the priest, and especially that one sacrifice on the Day of Atonement by the high priest going into the Holy of Holies, didn't take away that sin consciousness. 
people were still just as guilty, felt just as worthless as before the sacrifice. Now, he's proven that to us elsewhere, but for the sake of this passage, we're going to read on. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? See, if those sacrifices could get the job done, you wouldn't have to offer them again because the job was done. Because that, the worshipers, once purged, should have no more conscience of sins. If those sacrifices actually worked, to do what needed to be done to convince you that you're worthy. It's kind of like the difference people have in, in the attitude they have towards God, you know. I was counseling with a woman one time, and she was very, very distraught with that same consciousness. This was years ago. And I was trying to encourage her, you know, and tell her who God had made her to be and who she was and all that. And I told her, do you realize you're a member of the body of Christ? And her comment to me was, yeah, I know, I'm a wart on his butt. still felt worthless, didn't she? That's that thin consciousness we're talking about. He said, if those sacrifices prescribed by the Mosaic Law that Israel followed religiously right up until the time of Christ, if they worked one time, and you wouldn't have any more sin conscience. The point is, they didn't work. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year we're well, talking about specifically the day of atonement where the high priest went in to make sin atonement for the sins of all the nation what does that do when you're offering when you're continually offering sacrifices to god when you're continually doing that daily and especially once a year that's not removing the problem that's not getting rid of the sin consciousness it's remembering the sin consciousness it's remembering how screwed up you are now let me just ask you this question just offhand I won't ask you to raise your hands here but how many of you have trouble remembering how screwed up you are hmm? You don't. It plagues you. That's a sin consciousness that he's talking about here. So let's move forward here. He says, when you try to do a sacrifice, and I've seen this in Christians a lot of times over my years in the ministry, what they do is they promise God they'll never do that again. Have you ever done that? Oh, man. God, if you forgive me, I will never do this again. And two hours later, they do it. And so what do they have to do? They've got to beat themselves up, go back before God, and get Him to forgive them again based on some sacrifice. Now, depending on how technical your religion is, you'll offer a sacrifice of some sort because you screwed up again. And over and over and over the cycle goes. We've got to get beyond that cycle. That's what our author of Hebrews is wanting to teach us. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Animal sacrifices, ritualistic sacrifices prescribed by the Mosaic Law never took away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. Now, who's talking here? When John, 
and to baptize him at the Jordan River. When he saw, I might get down here and get him, but I don't know if I can get up. When he saw Jesus walking on the shore by the Jordan River, he cried out, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. This is the Lamb of God talking here. He's saying, in essence, making this declaration to God and to us that God has no interest, gets no satisfaction out of sacrifices and offerings repeated over and over and over again. But notice what he says at the last part of that verse. He says, In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure. Then he said, Lo, I come in the volume of the book that is written of me to do thy will, O God. What's he talking about here? He's talking about Jesus on the mission that God sent him into the world for to take away sins. He says, But a body hast thou prepared for me. You see, Jesus' body was uniquely prepared by God. You realize that? That's why he was born of a virgin. No other body would do the job. He had to be virgin born as the seed of the woman. That's the body God prepared for him. To do what? To do God's will and do it perfectly. That's why he goes on again to say, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin that has no pleasure I come to do your will above when he says sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin thou wouldest not neither hast pleasure in them which are offered by the law then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Now, what is that statement by Jesus really saying? He's saying, in essence, in just everyday plain English, English, he, what he's saying is, Look, all that stuff didn't get the job done. I'm here to do for you what you could never do for yourselves no matter how many sacrifices you made, no matter how many rituals you performed, it would be not enough. And in that statement, he's inaugurating the new covenant that we've already talked about, the new covenant of grace to supersede and take the place of the old covenant of law. Now, how relevant is that to us today? Just think about it for a moment. He says, I've come to take away the first that he may establish the second. What is he talking about? The first covenant was a covenant of law. It was a covenant that depended upon your efforts, your efforts to sacrifice, your efforts to behave yourself, your efforts not to screw up. Those are the efforts you've been doing all your life. Every one of us has been doing that. Naturally, we try as hard as we can not to screw up. Naturally, we try as hard as we can to do what's right and not do what's wrong. Unfortunately, it never works. You can try as hard as you can not to screw up, but you're going to screw up. You know that. So he takes away the first, the old covenant, in which God dealt with sins by a sacrifice which just covered them over temporarily. 
in which God now deals with sins in the new covenant in a radically different way. And I want you to see this. He said, I came to do your will, O oh God. I came to take away sin totally, to remove the sins of the world. Now, in essence, what he's saying is this. It's kind of the same thing that Paul told the Galatians who came to this new covenant of grace, believed that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, were what we would term being born again and becoming a Christian. But their idea of that was limited. Their concept of that was way too small. First of all, what they get the idea of, and many people have this, even today, they get the idea that when you're born again, when you become a Christian, when you believe on Jesus as your personal Savior, whatever term you want to describe, describe that with, that God wipes your slate clean from all sin. Right? You receive forgiveness for all the stuff you did that was wrong, that was bad. Not counting the evil and ugly stuff. God wiped your slate clean. But now that you're a Christian with a slate that's been wiped clean, now it's your responsibility to keep that slate clean by what you do or don't do. Right? Does that sound familiar to anybody? That's typical religious BS. It's not in the Word of God. In fact, the very opposite is in the Word of God. When Paul saw that the Galatians were doing that, trying their best to keep that slate clean by following the rules and regulations of the, of the Judaizers, especially concerning the rite of circumcision, he just point blank told them, you have made Christ of none effect, you have fallen from grace. What's he talking about? You've lost your salvation? No. That's not what he's talking about. You have left the new covenant of grace and gone back under that old covenant of works. I can't tell you how miserable that makes Christians. Man, they are so miserable in that condition. They'll do anything to take an edge off. And they do. You ever hear about the preacher running off with his secretary in the building fund? Hmm? You ever hear about the deacons molesting little boys in Sunday school? You ever hear about that craziness of religion? You know where it comes from? It comes from leaving grace as a lifestyle and going back under the law try to do it yourself with your own do-it-yourself program. So Paul goes on to tell the Galatians, God doesn't care what you do or don't do. That's not how it works. What you do means nothing to God. What you don't do means nothing to God. What you do or don't do has no merit in it whatsoever. Well, what does God want? One thing and one thing only. He wants you to believe what He's done for you in Christ. Amen. Always. Not just when you're first born again, oh yeah, I know Jesus died on the cross for my sins, but He rose again from the dead so you could have a brand new lifestyle of grace rather than go back under that lifestyle of law in which you try your best to keep the rules. 
Why are you trying your best to keep the rules? You're trying to keep that slate clean. See, that's a fundamental mistake that Christians make that religion takes advantage of so they can manipulate Christians into doing what they think is necessary for them to do to make themselves look good. Now, our author of Hebrews is indirectly address addressing that, but he is addressing that very problem when he goes on to say that when Jesus came, he took away the old covenant of law and replaced it with the new covenant of grace by the which we will, by the which will, and I'll explain that in a minute, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You see, we underestimate the value of that sacrifice of Christ on the cross. We think he just wiped the slate clean. No, he didn't just wipe your slate clean. He made you a brand new person that's incapable of sinning. He didn't just wipe your slate clean and say, now try it again, knowing you would screw up. No. He did for you what you can't do for yourself in managing your daily life. So the way I like to... Like to, like to describe this aspect is God not only saved you from the guilt and penalty of your sin in the past, but He is right now, this moment, saving you from the very presence of sin in your life right now. See, Christians who worry about what they're going to do about their sin in their life have no idea of the new covenant. They have no idea of the grace of God. Why? Because you, even as a Christian, you can't deal with that sin that's still in this flesh, in this body. You can't deal with it. You're powerless. Like Paul said in Romans chapter 7, when I want to do what's right, I can't do it. When I want to quit doing what's wrong, I do it anyhow. Oh, wretched man that I am, Who's going to deliver me? I thank God through Jesus, my high priest. He's the one that's going to deal with this everyday sin in the flesh. Not you. Your puny prom promises to God mean nothing. Because that's not what he's looking for. What he's looking for is you to trust him despite the sins in the flesh. And so our author tells us here, by the which will, that's the will of God, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. It's a done deal. When Jesus offered himself a sacrifice, that took care of your sins in the past, it takes care of your sins right now, and it took care of your sins in the future. It's once. Asking him to forgive you and then promising you're going to be good again. That cycle. It's like a priest offering daily to take away sin. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. 
from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. You see the difference here? All our sacrifices, all our offerings to God, promising we're going to be good and all that, that stuff, didn't do any good. But Jesus, in his sacrifice, in his offering, sat down on the right hand of God. That is assuming the executive authority of God to deal not only with the sins of the whole world, but your sin Amen. daily. From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. You get that? By one offering. By what he did for you, you couldn't do for yourself. He made you perfect. Because you are in Christ. And you can't get any better than that. That's your new identity in Christ. You, in effect, are Christ. Now until we get that idea to replace that everyday common sin consciousness, we'll never act like Christ. But we can be religious but the motives of the flesh will still be there. That fear, guilt, and pride. Even though we're doing religious things, still be there. It's not until you believe that you, because of what Christ has done, has made you to become one with Him, that you are perfected forever, that you can begin to have some hope about yourself. You realize, in common language, you're okay. God has done everything necessary to make you okay. You're secure in His love. You're significant in His plan. You are loved, accepted, and forgiven. You are important. Your life has meaning and purpose to it. And you are adequate to fulfill that purpose. Who did that for you? God did it for you in that one sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And when you realize that, you choose to believe that, you have hope. What does that hope do? It's a joyful expectation about your future. What does that do for you? That hope frees you from your natural selfishness long enough to care about other people. That hope sets you free from your self-centered view of life, wondering what's in it for you. It sets you free from that because you know you're okay. And you can begin to think and care for other people around you. That's love. To the Galatians, Paul said, it's not what you do or don't do that counts with God. What counts with God is your faith which continually works itself out in love. Now let me just close with telling you why you all are here. You're here to love other people like Christ. That is your high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's why he left you here. Because where you're going as his child is a whole hell of a lot better than Okeechobee. Where you're going and in your father's house is more glorious than anything you can imagine here on this earth. So why wouldn't he just take you on home if he loved you? He's left you here for a purpose. He's left you here for a reason. And that purpose and that reason is for you to be able to love other people just like his son Jesus. See, that's why Jesus told his disciples, anyone that believes on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these, meaning longer than three and a half years, shall you do. You see, you're here for a specific purpose. 
Now when that purpose is over, when it has been fulfilled, God's going to tell, tell you, just like he told my brother Tom the other day, come on home, thou good and faithful servant. Come on home. It's time. Amen. Your job has been fulfilled. Come on home. Now in order to get to an understanding of that and a practice of that, we're going to have to believe what he tells us in the New Covenant. And that's what he closes this section with when he says, The Spirit bears witness of this whole thing of God doing for you what you can't do for yourself by saying God will put his law in your mind and write it on your heart. What that means essentially is God's going to give you the want to do what he wants you to do. And not only that, your sins and your iniquities, God will remember no more. Now, if God's not remembering your sins and iniquities, why the hell are you? <laughs> Think about that. If He's not remembering how worthless you were and how you screwed everything up, why are you dwelling on it? He's not. When He looks at you, He sees His Son, Jesus. He sees the righteousness of Christ. And when you believe that, you have the hope to be able to to see other people that way and to be able to love them like Christ does. The good news of the new covenant of grace is simply this. You live and walk by faith alone, apart from any works whatsoever. You continually believe what God has is and will do for you under the new covenant of grace that you could never do for yourself. See, that's why Jesus encouraged us to get in His yoke. You're laboring and heavy laden, you're trying to behave yourself and you can't. Jesus said, get in my yoke and learn of me. Take my yoke upon yourself. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's what he's called, our author has called us to by telling us to enter into the rest of God. He's talking about learning to live a brand new lifestyle in grace and truth rather than the old natural lifestyle of law and lies. So let's close with prayer. Father God, as we come into your presence, I thank you. I thank you for the privilege that we have of being able to get into the yoke with you, Jesus. The privilege we have of believing that you've done everything necessary to make us worthy. And Father, I thank you for the opportunity we have right now in your grace to trust you to deal with us in our sins and set us free in hope that we might be able to love others around us that we might be able to love our families love our co-workers love those strangers out there we thank you for that privilege Father and we ask you to continue to teach us by your spirit as only you can do for these things I pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Appreciate you all being here. Go in peace. Keep in mind that we're going to have a viewing here at 1 o'clock. A celebration of life for Tom at 2 o'clock. And then that will be followed by a dinner in the building there for all to come. All right. <laughs>